the guest uh, today. Uh, we have our guest Hector, Hector mm -hmm. Olivares, who arrived uh, yesterday and will stay for a couple of days to collaborate with our astrophysics group. And uh, Hector uh, is a theoretical astrophysicist. Uh, he did his PhD in 2019. Uh, in Frankfurt, get the uh, university in theoretical uh, physics uh, institute under supervision of Professor uh, Luciano Rezola. And since then, he worked uh, for three years already in Nijmegen, uh, in the Netherlands, as a postdoc. Uh, he is member of the uh, group led by Professor Mościbrowska and uh, Heino Falke. And he specializes uh, in um, Numerical relativistic astrophysics. Uh, he's uh, studying the behavior of the plasma uh, in the extremely curved uh, space times in the vicinity of black holes. And he's one of the main developers of the code BHAT, uh, standing for black hole accretion, uh, which was used as one of the tools uh, developed to build library. Uh, which served to analyze the image of the supermassive black hole uh, in the galaxy M87, which was uh, discovered uh, many years ago, but the image was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope very recently, and I hope uh, Hector will now uh, explain to us how this image was, was taken and all the physics of black holes as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka, for the introduction and also for giving me the chance to, to speak uh, to you today. So, well, indeed, um, my work concerns mainly the science of the of the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, probably you have, oh, there's some light. Uh -huh. Probably you have you have seen um, these images and know about this array. This is an uh, uh, an air size array of radio telescopes that, that uh, are pointed at the same time towards um, these sources. And these are the, this um, was used to take the first images of a, of a, a black hole. This is the, the uh, image of the black hole in, at the core of the galaxy M87 that, that was uh, released in 2019, uh, together with the, the polarization field that you can see here that was released in, in 2021. And here is the, the first image of another uh, black hole that is very important because it is the, the black hole at the core of our own galaxy. Um, and this image was released in, in 2022. 20, uh, so obtaining these images was a, was a huge um, technical achievement. Um, but I, I know that, that recently um, you have here in, in this in place uh, Maciek Bielbus, who, who probably uh, already told you about that. Uh, so my, focus, my, my talk will focus more on the on another aspects on the on the theoretical aspect, which is uh, what information we can get from these images, how uh, we what we did in order to get uh, this information, what are the limitations of the analysis that, that was made, and what are we doing about uh, these limitations. So um, these images look, look uh, quite blurry, and, and you may wonder what, what can we learn from, from something uh, like this, right? But it turns out that, that actually uh, there are many things that, that we can uh, learn from these um, first images. We know, for instance, uh, some information on the space time. We know that, uh, that um, both black holes have likely a, a, a non-zero spin. We know that probably the direction of the spin of the black hole of M87 points away from us. We know that the, that the jet that, that goes out from this uh, black hole is likely powered by the blank force static mechanism. And also we know that in both cases, uh, the magnetic fields are huge and probably dynamically important close to the, to the black hole. We were also able to learn something about the, the electron thermodynamics, about the, the ratio between electron and, and proton temperature in the environment of the black hole. But probably one of the most important things that we have learned uh, is related to, to this dark region in, in the middle of these images. This dark region is a, a consequence of what is called the shadow of a black hole, which is an effect that is uh, purely related to the space and properties. And by checking uh, the, the size of this dark region against the theoretical prediction, we know that both of the images are consistent uh, with general relativity over three orders of, of magnitude in mass. 
because this, uh, this black hole is a bit more than, than 1,000 times uh, the mass of this other black hole. If you, if you add this to the results obtained by the, by the gravitational wave experiments, we now know that the general relativity is consistent over a, a, a huge range of um, magnitudes in, in mass. So, but well, I, I was thinking, I was saying that, that uh, I would talk about how uh, we learn from um, this information. So uh, we obtained this information by comparing the observations with a huge set of numerical simulations. And um, the, the way this, this um, comparison is done is, uh, is not a, a, is not a, a, a simple um, process, but it actually contains several uh, layers of, of physics. As, as you can see here, uh, we can, for instance, start with a, with a space time model, the, let's say the, the Kerr metric. And on top of this, you, we can use this uh, space time model as the scenario on which we evolve uh, a, a magnetized plasma. Then um, this magnetized plasma will be the, the source uh, that we use for doing radiative transfer calculations. So we, we uh, simulate first the behavior of matter and then the behavior of, of radiation. And finally, we use the image that we get in order to um, predict how observation will look, taking into account uncertainties for in instruments and observing conditions. And uh, well, you may think that this is the, the actual image that was taken, but this, this image is actually uh, from a simulation. So this is, this is not really the, the, the picture of black hole, but this is something that, that was obtained uh, through this synthetic image generation process. And as you can see, it is, it is quite similar. So this indicates that we are doing things in the right direction. So you also may wonder how we can decouple these, these uh, different physics. Right, because in principle, plasmas could interact with radiation uh, due to exchange of momentum via radiation pressure or uh, via cooling. But actually, uh, for specifically these systems, we have something that is really nice, which is that we can decouple some scales due to the um, due to the difference. Um, well, you can decouple some physics due to the difference in, in scales. For instance, we can decouple the evolution of the space time from that of the of the plasma. Uh, by noticing that the black hole mass is much bigger than the, than the mass of the accretion disk that, that surrounds the black hole. And we can decouple the dynamics of radiation from the dynamics of the plasma by noticing that the cooling time is also orders of magnitude larger than the, than the inflow time of the, of the plasma. So practically plasma does, don't cool and one can neglect interactions with radiation. Um, however, this is not, not uh, always possible. And there are other cases where in which we uh, cannot decouple scales uh, so easily. For instance, even, the, even if we just look at the, at the plasma, there are uh, several scales that are involved at, at once and that all of them play a role in the structure of the accretion flow. So we are interested in, in learning what happens in the strong gravity regime, so close to the event horizon. Um, here there is an, a region that is called the ergosphere that is, is thought uh, to be the region from which the, the jet is launched. But if one um, wants to find the, the configuration of the flow here, one uh, needs to start from the place where the, where the accretion flow is originated. And at, at least in, in Sagittarius star, Sagittarius star, so at the core of our, our galaxy, this happens at uh, 10 to the 4 gravitational radii. So here we already we have a, a large scale of magnitude separation. And if we want also to look at the outflows, uh, for instance, the, the jet that goes out from the core of M87, is um, uh, reaches uh, 10 to the 5 gravitational radius. So there, there is a, a huge separation in, in scale. Uh, this also works in, in the other direction because there are also micro scales that, that uh, need to be considered and, and that may also play an important role. Uh, first, we think, or at least in the, in the standard model of, of uh, accretion disks, one uh, believes that the um, that angular momentum is transported in the accretion disk due to the, what is called the magnetorotational instability. If, if one need, wants to properly simulate this instability, one uh, needs to resolve the, the um, fastest growing mode of this instability, and this is of order of, of one gravitational radius, so this, this sets a minimum resolution for the simulations that, that we want to make. But there are also other important scales about we, uh, we don't have uh, a lot of information. 
So um, there are probably uh, processes that are related to turbulence, to dissipation that, that determine the, the heating of the, um, of the plasma. And that likely happen at, at uh, these length scales much uh, smaller than one gravitational radius. And there are also, um, um, well, other effects. Well, for example, the, the most of the emission is controlled by the electron distribution function. And we have very little idea of, of what is the, the right electron distribution function of this system. And one reason is because uh, even though we typically use the, the fluid approximation, these plasmas are actually more collisionless. So it is, it is not, um, it is not a, a perfect approximation. There are particles that are accelerated. There are particles that deviate from a, from a thermal distribution. And this is something that, that uh, needs to be uh, modeled. However, uh, well, in order to make progress, we need to, to start from the simple things. So, so we, um, all the models that are, that are present in the, in the Event Horizon Telescope Library are models uh, that treat the plasma as, a, as, a, as an ideal fluid. So uh, under the framework of general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics, or ERUHD. These are the, the conservation equations, sorry, the equations that are, that are solved by the codes that produce the simulations as, as the code on which I uh, work. Um, and it, this is basically a set of conservation equations. This uh, is just written in the notation of, of general relativity, but these are four divergences that, that state the conservation of, of different quantities. The conservation of, of particle number density, uh, the conservation of energy and momentum, and the two Maxwell equations, which, which can also be regarded as, as uh, conservation equations. And we can, um, I can give more details about how this can be done uh, later if you are interested. But this can be done as, uh, this can be treated as conservation equations. Um, we also need a set of, of uh, closer relations that are basically the, the general relativistic expressions for the energy momentum tensor that contains quantities such as pressure and, and density of the fluid. Um, the expression for the Faraday tensor that contains the electric and, and magnetic fields. And we need to close the system with, a, with another relation that is the equation of, of state of the, of the fluid. The numerical methods that we uh, use to evolve these partial differential equations are called finite volume methods. And these are uh, really, really nice methods that allow to keep uh, at each time a uh, machine precision fulfillment of these um, this, this conserved quantities. What is J mu? Which is what is? Uh, G mu? Yeah, the, on the right, F, F mu equal to four, G. Four currents. Uh, Charge and current. Ah, this one, G mu is a, is, a, is a four current. So these are just tensor indices in, in general relativity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if that was uh, the question. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. Uh, no, it is just a general relativity notation for conservation equations. No, you, you said something uh, that uh, electromagnetic equation can be presented in the form of a oh, special equation. form, but to me it's just standard form, and that's why I was asking that something. Ah, right. Uh, so probably, so this is indeed this is a special form of the equation. It is it is the same. So yes, um, this is just the Maxwell equation. So I, I was just saying that that this can be regarded as a conservation okay. equation. Okay. Because it is a conservation equation for the for the magnetic and the electric flux. Okay, I saw the sound yeah. expression. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, well, then the methods that are, that we use to evolve these are called finite volume methods. These uh, have the peculiarity that, that they allow for machine precision conservation of these quantities. So if one integrates the the, the total, uh, let's say, particle number density in the simulation, it always stays constant. And this is this is done by uh, splitting the domain in different cells and uh, calculating the fluxes that go from one cell to another. So since these are calculated consistently for the two cells and, and everything that go, comes out from these cells goes, goes into the next one, uh, this, uh, so it preserves the number from one uh, time to the other. Mm -hmm. yes. But geometry is assumed to be uh, fixed a priori. In this case, uh, for these simulations, geometry is, is assumed to be fixed. And this is, this is as, as I was what saying before. What do you mean the curve uh, metric? It, is a, uh, it can be the, the curve metric, or it can be other metric. I, I, can, I will show that later. But uh, indeed, for this system, um, we have this uh, decoupling between the background metric and the plasma, because the plasma is, is too light. 
So the, the, the black hole is uh, millions of solar masses in, in uh, mass, and the, and the plasmas are extremely diluted. Yeah, so, yeah, so they yeah, are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, so this is, this is um, with a fixed metric. So, well, now that I, I talked to you about, about this, I, I take what, a question. What is, what is the meaning of the four vectors E and B? These are three vectors. These are, uh, uh -huh, the, this is correct. So these, these B and E are, pro, are uh, projections of, the, um, of this Faraday tensor on the velocity of the um, uh, Eulerian observer. So indeed, uh, this, these are vectors that, that have uh, the time component equal to zero. It is just to, well, to have the expression consistent between the left so and the right. These are three, right. three vectors, so the notation is misleading. They are four no. vectors, but the zero component is zero. Exactly, yes. <laughs> yes, there are four vectors with the zero component zero, yeah. so, that, so that the notation is, is consistent. But if it is uh -huh. zero, then this is not a general statement because it depends on the coordinate system. That is correct. Uh -huh. So the, this, um, these electric and magnetic vectors um, are specific for an Eulerian observer. Mm -hmm. okay. no. Yes, I'm not sure if I am speaking too loud. <laughs> It's okay. Um, right. So, well, then I, I, I want to take the occasion to do some small advertisement on the, on the code that, that, on which I worked and uh, that was part of my PhD thesis. So this is the, the black hole accretion code. As uh, Agnieszka was mentioning that at the beginning, uh, this was used to generate part of the library of the, of the Event Horizon Telescope. It uses the methods that I, that I just described, and it has nice features like adaptive mesh refinement. So this is a, a snapshot of a simulation of, a, of an accretion uh, disk. The black hole is here in the, in the middle, and, and here you can see everything. It has these adaptive meshes, so it, it adapts the resolution to where it is uh, needed the most. And you can download it from here and, and play with it. If, if you want, it, it, we try to keep it well documented with manuals and tutorials. Um, and well, as I was saying in the beginning, you, no, don't need to use it uh, specifically for uh, accretion onto black holes because it is it is written in such a way that you can easily change the, the metric. So um, it has been used for a lot of things like black hole simulations as, as in the event horizon telescope papers, but it has also been used in, on flat space time, but with relativistic simulations to study uh, magnetic hydrodynamic turbulence and, and magnetic reconnection. We have uh, simulated accretion on exotic objects like boson stars and, and proca stars and even uh, to simulate more exotic space times, like a, a warp bubble um, traveling through the, through the space, we wanted to, to see how the electromagnetic signature of, of this will, would look like. But uh, we can talk about this uh, at another time. But also, we have used it to simulate black hole binaries, because one, one can um, well take the binary of the the metric of the binary as, as peaks if one moves to the to the uh, frame where the binary is rotating and neglect gravitational radiation. So that this is also something, some work that we have in progress. But let's let's go back to the to the main topic. So this was just advertising. Uh, then, well, uh, as I was saying, plasmas are one ingredient, but we need also to simulate the, the behavior of radiation. To uh, study the behavior of radiation, we use a, a completely different uh, set of tools. So they, now we have not any more partial differential equations, but we have ordinary differential equations. Uh, the way we produce these images it is similar to the, to the methods that are used, for instance, in, in video games to generate uh, volume, uh, well, to generate renderings of, of objects in which um, that have refraction or reflections. This method is called ray tracing. And the main difference is that, that now uh, these are no longer straight lines, but we simulate ray tracing in a cool space. And so the, the um, uh, light rays follow from the geodesic equation. So once we have our geodesics, we integrate on, on them the radiative transfer equation, which is here. This, equations, uh, this equation tells uh, the amount of intensity of, of light and, the, and its polarization. Um, from looking at the emissivities of the, of the plasma, the absorptivities, and, and some other coefficients that are called uh, rotation coefficients that, that rotate the, the polarization. And the radiative processes that we consider are synchrotron radiation, uh, Compton, and, and, and well, we don't consider actually Compton per production because these, these are in a different regime than the wavelengths studied for the event horizon telescope. But in principle, all, all of these uh, are the, the process that participate in, in um, 
producing the uh, synthetic observation. So, um, well, now we have all the ingredients, and, and um, with these ingredients, we, we can create this library of, of simulations. So um, we have some parameters that are set by the, by the plasma properties. Uh, completely, these are the, the magnetic plots, how, how magnetized is the, the accretion disk and the black hole spin. And we have to make a Cartesian product between these parameters and a set and the set of parameters that is done at the uh, radiative transport step. Uh, the, the parameters that are controlled by the radiative transport step are the electron distribution function that is assumed, uh, the inclination, the position angle, so how, how much it is rotated in the, in the sky and how, how much it is inclined with respect to the observer. And um, with these uh, parameters, these parameters are a bit free, let's say, and we, at the same time, we fit other parameters like the like the black hole mass, the distance to the to the source, and the and the uh, total integrated uh, luminosity flux. And among these simulations, the the those that, that uh, played a, a most important part in the ESG analysis are what are called the fiducial models. Uh, these fiducial models are um, so work um, like this. We start the GRMHD simulation from a, a setup that consists of a torus that is in equilibrium ar around the, the black hole. Then uh, this torus has um, a poloidal magnetic field, and we add some perturbations in the form of, of white noise. These perturbations, uh, combined with the magnetic field, trigger a, a process that is called the magnetorotational instability that, that I mentioned before, and it produces turbulence. So we start from, from a setup like this. This is a, just a, a quarter of the of the torus. The black hole should be like here. And then and when we evolve it, we end in a setup that looks similar to, to the figures that are here. So there is uh, there is a turbulent torus and there is a, a jet that forms uh, and that, that flows out from the black hole. Uh, we produce two different kinds of scenarios. One of them is the called the standard and normal evolution or same that is less magnetized. And another, the other one is called the magnetically arrested disk that is uh, more magnetized. And it's called like, like that because um, at some point there is so much uh, magnetic flux that it becomes dynamically important and stops accretion. So that, that's, that what it, that's why it is called uh, magnetically arrested. So um, in addition to, so now that we have this, this library of simulations, we also need to put constraints on, on them because we, we uh, want to evaluate these models and see how well they, they perform in reproducing what, what we see in the, in the observations. And uh, well, there are several countries that are, that are very uh, used to do that. And actually those for MMT7 are, are a bit uh, different from those for of Sagittarius say star because the, the systems are different in some respects. But here, well, the countries that I am uh, listing here are those that belong to the uh, system of Sagittarius A star. So some of them are, for instance, the, the size of the image at, at observing frequency, 230 yeah. gigahertz. Um, we, there, is also, well, there are also countries on the morphology of the, of the ring, and, but there are also countries that are uh, external to the, to the event horizon telescope. For example, the, the, also the, the flux and the size of, of the image at, at, uh, at uh, 86 gigahertz, um, or the or the X-ray flux that can also so the, that that also can also be obtained from simulations, but but is um, but of, is not obtained in observations by the EHT, but by other instruments like uh, Chandra or uh, NUSTAR. So in addition to this, we have also other constraints uh, that are based on variability, so not on, not on the image. Uh, one of them, one of it is the, the light pool variability. So we have a, a time series of the flux versus time, and we see how uh, variable it is in the source compared to how variable it is in, uh, in our simulation. So the plot that you can see here, uh, summarizes all the constraints that were applied to the to the uh, to the different models of the uh, event horizon telescope for Sagittarius A star. Um, this the angle represents in, represents inclination. The top panels are the same models. The bottom panels are the the more magnetized mass models. And this is um, the the different radii represents a, a parameter that is related to the to the electron uh, thermodynamics. 
it, it turns out, as you can see, that, the, that this set of constraints is actually very, very constraining. So um, a lot of models are rejected. Here, um, the red means that, that um, all models are rejected. Uh, the um, the um, yellow color means that some of the constraints pass and some and some of the other, or some others don't pass for those models. And actually, here at least for Sagittarius star, there are only two sets of models that, that pass all the constraints, and these are just the, these uh, highly magnetized mass models observed at, at this inclination and with this uh, parameter for electron thermodynamics. So it is, it is just a, a single set of, of um, a single set of, of models. So well, what I want to, to highlight here is the, the large constraining power that, that these observations already have, even, even with this uh, blurry image. Um, however, well, this is the this is the, the nice picture. This is the, also the, the conclusion of the of the papers by the Ben Horizon Telescope. But one uh, well, as always, one needs to be aware of the limitations of, of these models, and then well. This is this is what I will uh, speak about in the in the rest of, of my talk. And the first thing to say is that these conclusions are of course valid based on this analysis, but they are valid within the universe of models that was used to to run those simulations. So the set of fiducial models that I that I just described. Um, and there is also also something that is very interesting. So in the in the last plot, uh, I showed all the constraints uh, but one. Uh, Interestingly, there are no there. So the, um, if one looks at the con at the constraints for variability, it looks e almost the opposite way as the as for all the other constraints. So these these models that pass all the constraints don't pass the the constraint for variability. They are too variable, and and instead these same models that that fail almost all the constraints are the only ones that that, fail, that pass uh, this constraint for for variability. So one may wonder uh, what is happening. So it is maybe that the, that the, that the constraint on variability was too strict. Maybe there is some uh, additional physics that we are uh, not considering. If we just plainly look at the, at the observations, uh, forgetting a bit about the details of the analysis, um, the information that, that we obtain is just that the, um, it, so the, the, let's say this, the um, um, information that we can trust is about the size of the, of the source. Uh, that the spectrum is similar to what you get, you would get if you have a, a jet, but there is um, at the same time little asymmetry. And well, we can uh, try to just uh, keep this on, on our minds and look for other uh, theoretical, more um, well, more theoretical models that, that try to overcome these limitations. And then, well, the, the question is then how how to improve. In which directions uh, we can explore to get to get better models. Um, it turns out that even since the analysis of the don't for BHD, there were some models that were uh, called exploratory models that are also part of the library. Uh, these these models uh, include uh, tilted disk, so disk for which the the angular momentum of the disk is not um, aligned with the with the, with the spin of the black hole. But this uh, model seems to be uh, very var variable. So if one wants to uh, do something better in respect to variability, the, this is probably not the, not at least not directly the the way we want to to go. Also, uh, non-thermal distribution functions for electrons have been tested, but they may they seem to not make uh, a lot of difference. And finally, there there is a set of model that uh, was not very much explored because there were very few of them and they are expensive to run but i actually i, I think that that could um, be really a, a, a change uh, these models are um, called wind fed models and here you have a, a well this is a bit difficult to, to read but i will i will tell you what these models uh, do so what is done for these uh, wind fed large scale models is that um, a domain that is extremely large is considered, so not, not just the, the region close to the event horizon, but um, let's say a, a, a box of one parsec um, size. And in this domain, uh, each of the orbits of the individual stars that are orbiting Sagittarius star are evolved. These stars are emitting winds, and then uh, the, these winds are followed from their source up to when they uh, form the, the flux, the accretion flow onto Sagittarius A star. So one has uh, um, uh, the structure of the accretion flow 
form uh, from first principles. Uh, there are also other directions that, that one may uh, go, like uh, kinetic peak simulations that, that take into account the, the kinetic and, and collisionless nature of, of these plasmas. But uh, well, these are um, computationally very expensive, and especially it is currently not possible to do um, um, simulations that, that respect the, the actual sizes of the, the actual scales of the of, of the black hole, and, and um, for example, um, skin depths of the plasma, and so on. So the the best that one can cope with these models is to respect the higher hierarchy of, of scales, hierarchy of, of scales. And um, so the, this is probably interesting, but, but this is difficult to explore at the moment. And uh, there are also uh, attempts to, to try models that include non-ideal effects. So precisely because of the, of the collisionless effects, uh, one would expect uh, some uh, non-ideal effects like, like uh, anisotropic uh, viscosity um, or, or heat conduction along uh, magnetic field lines. But this has been a bit tried, but there is also this also doesn't seem to be really a, a game changer. So the, the thing that is most interesting to work in, on my opinion, is to go to the to the large scales. Um, however, well, going to the large scales has its challenges. No, as, as I mentioned, one needs to consider scales that are that are uh, very computationally expensive. You, can, you need to go very far away to where the the accretion flow from stellar winds form. And at the same time, it, it also breaks the, the decoupling between physics, because uh, far away from the black hole, one needs to start including the effects of, of radiation. So here, the, this could represent the, the cooling time scale, and this one uh, represents the, the inflow time. So close to the black hole, they are very decoupled by several orders of magnitude. But if one uh, wants to look at the, at the scales that uh, where the accretion flow originates, then then uh, well the, the the two scales are comparable, and one forcefully needs to include the effects of, of cooling. Uh, however, the simulations that exist uh, now have showed properties that are very interesting, at the same time very different from the models that we have in the EHT library. Uh, first, in all of these models, as you as you have seen, uh, we start from a torus. And this comes from the assumption that the, that the uh, material had initially large angular momentum and it has been losing slowly the angular momentum until it, it uh, circularized uh, around the black hole. But what we see from this simulation is that the, the uh, plasma is launched from the stars with a very broad distribution of angular momentum. And there are, um, there, there are fluid elements that, that have, that are launched almost directly to, towards the black hole, so they have very low angular momentum and, and they have no sufficient time to circularize. This results in um, structures, structures that are very as asymmetric. We don't have nice tori anymore, but we have something like this. Uh, this is a, a, a cross section of a, of a torus forming this way, and we have a, a very thick side and a very thin side. And this is not even continuous every time, but sometimes it, this, this part is, is interrupted. Um, we also uh, find that the magnetorotational instability that, that we thought was the, the main mechanism to transport angular momentum in the disk is almost uh, unimportant in these simulations. This because it's because far away from the black holes, the, the magnetic field is very weak and it is almost passively advected without making any uh, effect on the flow. And close to the black holes, um, without any dynamo amplification mechanism, just because uh, the magnetic um, field processing condition of, of plasmas. If you compress the plasma, the magnetic field lines are also compressed because they are frozen in, in the plasma, and this increases the magnetic field. So close to the, to the black hole, the magnetic field becomes um, dynamically important, but at the same time, uh, the fastest growing mode of the MRI is related to the strength of the magnetic field. At some point, it exceeds the, the high scale of the disk, and this suppresses the magnetorotational instability. And, and for, some, uh, for that reason, it turns out that, that neither at large scales nor at, at, at horizon scales, uh, the magnetorotational instability is, is any longer uh, important. So, well, this, this interesting simulation were carried out by Sean Ressler in, in uh, well, some years ago. Um, and we wanted to start exploring the possibility of, of using uh, similar models, but without uh, having to simulate the, the, well, the paths of all of the stars, without having to, to simulate um, using also cooling. 
So uh, together with, with uh, Monica Moshibrotska um, in uh, Nijmegen and with Oliver Ford in, in Amsterdam, we tried to come up with a, with a setup that can include this information on the last <laughs> large scales, uh, but um, setting up something um, that, that is a bit simpler. So uh, our aim is to solve some limitations of the of the current simulation. So I already spoke about the inconsistency with the with the large scale uh, simulations, but there is also another another uh, limitation that that uh, these spiritual models have, and uh, which is that since the um, since all the matter is, is initialized in, in this torus around the black hole, this torus has a fin finite mass. So eventually. If this uh, this torus starts uh, losing mass, it, it gets um, it runs out of mass, and this affects uh, well. For instance, the, the light curve. One one see decreasing trends that that uh, are difficult to that make difficult the study of variability, and one needs to rescale every uh, certain time. And this is not even a very long time. It runs out of mass. It's just because. Simulation, yes. I mean, uh -huh, yes, because you, you started with a with a torus that's coming out, out of the numerical grid or something. Like it goes, to, it, it becomes swallowed by the black hole, so it exits the, uh, the domain. So this is physics, actually. Uh -huh, exactly, it, it, it is physical. Okay. So, uh, and I wanted to ask, mm -hmm. so what is the initial condition for such uh, simulation? Because we see some very unsmooth actual results. Uh -huh. If I would start the simulation with something like perfectly symmetric, mm -hmm. this symmetry probably would be preserved. Uh, so you have to give us the initial state, I would say probably something, I don't know, taken from observation or uh -huh. you are adding some noise. How, how the simulation is initiated? Actually? Well, uh, the, the fiducial simulations are in stages, as I, as I said, so you start with a symmetric torus, mm -hmm. but you add perturbations to it, so you add white noise in the, in the pressure. And this white noise. And this, uh, this triggers turbulence, and in the end you have a, a state that is no longer symmetric because turbulence have, uh, has developed. But wouldn't it be better maybe to take the initial state uh, partially based on observations? Or? The issue is, is that we don't know uh, how this looks, so we don't we don't know how <laughs> what is the observation. Exactly, we are trying to interpret the observation. There should be some self-consistent methods of taking something from the. Uh, that, that is so. That is precisely in the direction that, that we want to go. But I, I will um, speak again, speak of this in the, in the next slide. And well, regarding these these other um, kind of simulations, they are asymmetrical because they, the conditions uh, from which the plasma started are asymmetric. No? So they start from the following the stellar winds from the orbits of stars. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why one ends with these uh, non-symmetric structures. But can you observe also or constrain from observation the amount of angular momentum uh, uh, provided by those stars? Uh, this, is, this is interesting, and, and uh, so we have some ideas on on the uh, on what this angular momentum could be. For instance, from the from the gravity observations that that have um, observed that um, a blob that is orbiting the the uh, Sagittarius star, we. Need, if one looks at the, at the angular momentum that you obtain from this, it, it turns out that it is, it is similar uh, to the angular momentum that, that you get from the rotation of the innermost uh, cl cluster of world project stars. Um, so, so indeed, it seems that the that angular momentum uh, close to the black hole is, is more or less the same as, as, as that from the, from the stars. So there we have more or less idea of, of, of this. Um, right. So, um, so indeed, so we we want to be as, as much uh, inspired by observations as, as possible. No? But we we can also uh, try to get information, for instance, from the uh, about the, the plasma temperature and plasma density, and, and we can do this to some extent by the using the X-ray observations by by Chandler. But actually, the so the um, all um, several um, hundreds no. Um, around 10,000 of, of RG are contained within just a single pixel of the of Chandra observations. So it, it is really difficult to, to extract uh, information from here. So, so indeed, what, what we want to do with this research is to study the flow patterns in, in more general accretion scenarios that have a clearer connection uh, with the large scales and that are controlled by a reduced set of parameters so that you, we don't need to follow the, the paths of all stars. So the setup that, that we take into consideration is, is something similar to, to what you can see here. 
Um, so we perform the simulations in general relativity in 3D, and for the moment, because we want to start simple, we uh, add no magnetic uh, fields. The, so the setup um, consists of, of a transonic solution. That is a, a solution that has a, a point where uh, the flow speed is less than the speed of sound, and then it becomes larger than the speed of sound at some radius that is called the, the sonic radius. Um, and this is interesting and important because we can connect this to the to the large scale. So we can we can uh, cho choose this transonic solution for which there are analytical or or semi-analytic uh, expressions uh, and match the, this innermost pixel of the of the Chandra uh, of the Chandra data. But uh, we want to uh, well simulate this in a in some more realistic fashion so we we need to include perturbations from the assumed uh, turbulent accretion sorry turbulent um, interstellar environment so what we do is that to this setup that is characterized by black hole mass spin uh, length of the of the sonic radius and some angular momentum of the of the large scale flow uh, we add some perturbations we don't know which are which are realistic values for this perturbation? So we explore this by by orders of, of magnitude. So you perturb you is the internal energy, yes? Uh, no, actually here we perturb the the velocity. Ah, velocity. Okay, we, here we have velocity perturbations uh, with a with a red, with a wide noise spectrum. So we can control the the spectrum of, of the perturbations and and the amplitude. So um, well. This is a, this is the setup. Now let's look at an example of, of how uh, this looks. So I I, I brought um, this movie. I hope I hope I am not running out of time. Sorry. Um, right. So this is um, so we, this is our domain. We have the transonic solution. This is a, a movie on the equatorial plane, and this is a movie on the on the meridional plane. And these are different scales. These are the large scales, uh, middle scales, and event horizon scales. And one can already see that the, that the flow pattern that forms is very different from, from what we have in the typical fiducial simulations. Mm -hmm. So we have here first a, a shock that is, that is produced due to the um, centrifugal barrier that is, that is hit at, at, some, at some points. We have a, a, an asymmetric uh, torus structure forming here uh, that is not always um, aligned with the, with the equatorial plane. So it is, it is a bit, um, it's a bit wobbling. And we have also some filamentary structures that, that uh, go from the large scales to the um, uh, well to the innermost scales. And this is already an um, well, I would say, in, because but I of course say this because the, these are all models that this is already an improvement from the from the fiducial simulations in the HD library because these uh, simulations already have some connection with the with the large scales. Normally, uh, this would be just field of of some low density medium. Uh, emulating vacuum, and here we we have something that is uh, to some extent uh, self-consistent. So um, by varying the parameters uh, that, that you saw in the table, we actually get a, a, a large variations in the in the uh, structure of the accretion flow. So we have uh, flows that are almost um, quasi almost spherical and, and smooth. Um, if we go in the direction of increasing the angular momentum, so here is zero angular momentum to larger angular momentum, we have this kind of, of uh, toroidal uh, structures or these like structures that are dominated by turbulence. And we go from, from top to bottom, that means increasing the amplitude of perturbations, we get uh, these structures that are dominated by filaments and by, and by shocks. So a uh, uh, structure that is, uh, that is well, very different from the from the, simu the simulations of the EHT library, but the, but that in some uh, sense generalize and, and, and contain the simulations of the EHT fiducial models. Uh, we also see that these have very interesting other properties. So the, the transonic solutions that we take took as initial data uh, consider only one sonic transition. But um, in these um, models, we have several uh, sonic transitions. So the, here this, um, this is a plot of the uh, gradient of pressure. So the, the color indicates gradient of pressure, uh, blue, blue color indicates the presence of a shock, and the dashed line indicates the presence of a, of a sonic transition. So one can go, for instance, from, from here to the center and traverse uh, several uh, sonic transitions, several sonic uh, radii. We also um, see that 
in the cases that, that produce shocks, we have a, a change in the in the temperature profiles that also may relate our simulations to other accretion models that, that were studied previously semi-analytically that, that are called ADAP models for advection dominated accretion flows. So this is um, these are several temperature profiles for several simulations. Uh, these are the those with smaller perturbations, and this uh, red line um, is a case with with the higher perturbations. And we can see this how this deviates from the initial isentropic um, semi-analytic models that, that that keep being valid for the for the small perturbation cases and become uh, more similar to these other ADAP models that I, that I uh, mentioned. So this is, this in some, in some sense also uh, makes our models related to this other accretion scenario that, that was uh, known from before. Finally, well, if we look at the at time series that are generated from these models, we also see an, an improvement with respect to the, to the uh, fiducial models. So here, um, all of these um, time series represent the mass accretion rate at, at different times. Uh, this in scale of, of uh, three, four time scales, and here in, in um, geometric units. <laughs> and one can see that our simulation um, stays more or less around the oscillating around the, the same values, which is precisely the behavior that, that we can expect from a system that is quasi-stationary. While uh, this black line corresponds to the to the, the same time series mass accretion rate from, from one of these fiducial models, and we can see that, that there is this um, well exponential decrease, and and this is already an an, an improvement in, in our opinion. If we look at the um, uh, well at, at the variability properties of this, we also see interesting uh, results. Uh, for instance, these well these are spectro spectrograms of the um, of of this. Um, same time series, um, and we can see these spectrums were computed at different rates. So these, um, at the large scales, we injected white noise, but we can see that, that as we go closer to the to the black hole, um, more small scale modes uh, become populated, and in the end, uh, very close to the black hole, we end up with a with a red noise spectrum. So this is this is interesting because we we uh, get something different than, than what we put in. And this also is, is a, a natural behavior that we would expect because uh, it represents energy that is being transferred uh, from large, slow modes to smaller, uh, faster modes. Um, we see a similar behavior if we produce synthetic Bremsstrahlung uh, X-rays uh, light curves for this. But of course, well, we will be never complete until we um, introduce well, you know, on, until we consider synchrotron radiation, because that's the, the, that's the one that corresponds to the frequencies observed by, by the EHT. And we will never uh, be able to consider it until we introduce magnetic fields. So um, uh, the work that we are currently doing now, this is, this is by the way, in, on archive, it, it uh, came out uh, two weeks ago. So in, in case you want to, to have a look at it, uh, you can look uh, for my name, and, this, and it is the, the first paper that will appear. But we are still working on, on this. So the, what we are considering now is to add uh, magnetic fields. Uh, so this is already a, a, a simulation that, that was performed with magnetic fields. The, the structure of the plot is, is the same, except that the quantity that is plotted now is the strength of the magnetic field. And we can see here um, well how the, the structure of the flow pattern is. So uh, we inject perturbations uh, also uh, from the boundary. We see this turbulent magnetic field um, start populating the domain, and then when it approaches the sonic radius, uh, lines, magnetic field lines start becoming straight. So we also have these filaments, and close to the black hole, uh, mag the magnetic field becomes accumulated just because of this frozen in field uh, condition that I mentioned before, and we it starts increasing, and we have these uh, interesting turbulent. Structures. So this is this is work in progress. So I, I, that's what I just said coming soon. But I we will um, we are currently um, expecting new results some, sometime soon. So stay tuned in case you are you are interested. Uh, what on this. was your initial configuration of the magnetic field? <coughs> no, in this case it is um, so similar as we did for the velocities. We just added noise with some spectrum. In this particular case, uh, this is also white noise. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the initial um, shape of the magnetic field, was it dipole field or...? or no, 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 it's not, not any order field. 
Not ordered. Not ordered. So mm -hmm. we you also want to, to see what forms naturally if we put just something that is that is disordered. So what what pattern it acquires. So it is it is just a, it is just a, a field made of very small amplitude white noise. Um, right. So well then then we can this is this is basically my work. I I the what I wanted to share to you today. So um, to summarize, we have seen that the, that the ESG observations already have a, a large constraining power, but the interpretation of this observation is limited by the assumptions uh, behind the models. The most challenging aspect in, in, in that we need to match is variability. Uh, but at the same time, we see that large scale environment can drastically change the, the horizon scale phenomenology and, and is interesting to, to start considering. So we have these new models under development that, that we hope that can incorporate incremental information from the large scale by controlling the, the spectrum of the perturbations and the, and the values at the, at the boundary. And well, this is from the side of the, of the numerical modeling, but also uh, we expect that there will be some important developments from the side of the observing technology. So in, in, the, in the near future, the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, telescope um, will start making observations of higher frequency that, that will lack more resolution to the simulations. Um, there, is all, there are also plans that what more stations, and this, besides in, in improving the resolution, can also make the possibility, possi can make possible the generation of, of dynamical imaging, some, some movies of, the, of, of these uh, black holes. And this hopefully will also help us a lot understanding uh, the origin of variability. So just before finishing, I, I want to make a small advertisement uh, of another paper that, that we published in, in uh, July of, of last year. That is on a completely unrelated topic, but since, since I, I knew that this seminar was uh, for, a, for a broad audience. Um, so this um, paper is also about numerical methods, but it is, it is about numerical methods applied to uh, solving the Einstein equation, so numerical relativity. And what we did in this paper is uh, basically to rewrite the Einstein equations in, in a form that makes them very similar to the Maxwell equations. So this you can um, this resembles a lot the, the Maxwell equations in uh, general relativity in the in the three plus one formulation, except that they are not the Maxwell equations; they are the, the equations of general relativity. So the Einstein equations and the Einstein constraints uh, become something similar to the to the uh, Ampere Maxwell law and, and to the Gauss law for electric um, fields. The first Bianchi identity becomes something similar to the uh, Faraday law and, and to the uh, non monopole uh, condition. And well, these are other equations that are used in this, uh, in this formulation. And the nice thing about this is that there is a lot of technology that has been developed and that we are using all of these simulations to, to solve accurately the, the Maxwell equation. There are even uh, methods that allow to preserve these constraints uh, to machine precision. And this is at the moment not something that is not possible in, in standard numerical relativity. So this is, this is something we are also, also working on. And uh, if, if you are interested in, in reading about this formulation and, and how these um, techniques from uh, evolving Maxwell equations can be recycled and applied to numerical relativity, uh, you can have a look at, uh, at this paper. And uh, yes, so this is this is everything um, that I prepared for today, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> well, now we have time for questions. So you you managed very well without uh, dark matter, and in large scale calculation, I would expect something. You just explain me why. If why? We're talking about this and you don't. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, dark matter is, is another layer of, of, of complication no? in, in some sense. I, I also would expect that there, that there are effects from, from dark matter uh, close to the black hole. So uh, in the end, well, the, the, um, the models for the profile of dark matter pr uh, predict uh, costs near to the, to the center of galaxies. No? So, it is possible that, that one could see some, some effect from dark matter. But the, the well modeling of, of dark matter is so uncertain that, that um, I think at the moment this is something that, that we, um, so we, we need to concentrate first on the, on the things that are 
um, easier to simulate, and then we can we can go uh, in that direction. But this is of course something very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mariana. Yes, you said that you were playing with uh, different metrics and pair of space of the what what were those uh, different alternatives to, to try or why? And why this? Huh? <laughs> well, uh -huh. which one? Right. So um, uh, well. This, the, the alternative metrics that I that I showed are basically these these three exotic cases that I presented: so uh, a boson star and a, a proca star and um, and this uh, war bubble. So um, well, the first um, the first one, the the boson star, is something that I started simulating before the um, before the the, the first uh, observations of M87 were analyzed. So um, at, at that time there was um, there well there was uncertainty still whether what we would find would be a black hole or maybe it could be something else. And precisely speaking about dark dark matter, so there are there are these models for uh, ultralight scalar fields or, or just light scalar fields that that can also clump and, and form structures. No? So the the idea was uh, well probably what we see there is, is not a black hole, but it is, it is just a, a clump of, of, of dark matter. And the and the simplest way of of um, of, of uh, producing an object that is made of uh, of some uh, coherent field is uh, is to make it with a scalar field and that is a that is a boson star. So uh, that's why uh, uh, we were interested in, in, in simulating this object. In, from the um, well, from the um, um, work that we did with that object. So we found that at, that at least the model that we studied is more most likely ruled out by the observations because it, it doesn't produce a, a shadow, it produces more something like a spherical uh, glow. But we found that there are actually conditions under which it, it can produce a, a shadow, or, or not a shadow, but, but a, a flux depression. Because it, it, the mechanism is completely different from what you see in, in black holes. It is, it is not due to, the, um, to a capture cross-section as in, as in black holes. But it is due to, um, a, to a combination of, of lensing and magnetohydrodynamic effects. So um, the question then that came was uh, maybe we don't have this for boson stars with the with the usual um, potential uh, phi squared, but maybe we have it for other uh, compact objects. Maybe we can we can mimic a, a, a black hole. Um, in this way, you know, uh, producing a, a dark region that has the similar size of a black hole shadow. And from this, um, so a, a group in Portugal uh, led by Carlos Herdeiro um, published a paper where they, where they had a, a model of, a, of one of these objects, the Proca star, that, that uh, was predicted to, to um, produce a, a fake shadow of precisely this size. So we wanted to test mm -hmm. how this would look if you introduce realistic. Um, realistic plasma accretion, and that, that, was it. that is what came after this, so that, that's the justification. And, and the work of is just because it is an interesting object, it's fun, no? and, and I assigned that project to a, to a bachelor student to see uh, what, what he could get. No? So that, that's, that's why that's the justification for this exotic space. Let's thank you.